you Jump, 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 jump What we done started Look at what we done started This the people party This is what we done started Peace and love, party people. It's Talib Kweli, the BKMC, the MCEO. I am the host of the world's best podcast, The People's Party. And today we are bringing you another wonderful and fantastic episode of The People's Party. As always, and as usual, I have my lovely and talented and funny and thought-provoking co-host, Jasmine Lee, in the place to be. What's up, Jasmine? What's up? How you feeling? I'm feeling good, feeling great. How are you? I'm good. I see you went with the lace today. Yes, I'm a little lacy, you know, a little... A little 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 racy. You know, sex appeal on my arms. <laughs> Don't want to give them too much. That's right. Sexy forearms covering there you go. <laughs> your hoodie. <laughs> Today, we're going to have a good time with this guest because this guest right here, man, there's a lot of people who I have personal relationships with on this show, but not all of them have completely inspired me since before I got famous. Mm. And this is one of those guests. Our guest today, if you are somebody who pays attention to this culture that we all participate in, you have to know who this guest is. He is a designer, a creator, a cultural bridge builder, an innovator connecting the worlds of skateboarding, punk rock, graffiti culture, hip hop, streetwear. I don't even know if they should call it streetwear, if that's what they call it. We're going to get a lesson in that today. Right. But streetwear wouldn't be where it is today without this man. He helped to shape brands that we all know like Fat Farm, Mecca, American Dream, Dub, put a stamp on DC shoes, work with Nike skateboarding. We're talking about the creator of one of the most important streetwear brands of all time, Alpha Numeric, one of my favorite brands. This is not only just an icon of the culture, this is a visionary. This guest is creative in a way that had serious impact on all of us, whether you knew it or, or not. not. A unique thinker, a bold visionary, a product of one of the most culturally rich periods in New York City's culture. I'm talking about Stack Ali himself, a major architect and my personal outlook on life. Ladies and gentlemen, put your hands together. Give it up for Ali Ashimore joining the people's Yeah, 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 yeah. Stack bundles. That was a oh, real, bro. real heavy, heavy uh, input. What's peace, up, bro? Peace, brother. How you doing? How you feeling? I'm good, bro. I'm good. Good to see you. Likewise. It's uh, last time we saw each other was when you were in San Diego and you uh, hit me up. You had the show at um, Music Box. Wow, okay. So it's like, it's already three years ago. That was three years ago. Hey, man. Man, Ali. That's three years. Wow. Yeah. Well, it's good to see you. Thank you for doing this Likewise, show. Likewise. Thank you for you having me. You were the type of guest that this show is built for. Wow. You know, because we want to give our flowers to the people in the culture who help build it. Your middle name is Oworka? It's my my mom's last name. Ah, okay. So <clears throat> when my parents were in my teen years, um, I decided to add that name because I okay. thought that she was the last of the Oworkas. Ah. So it's hyphenated last name. Shout out to your moms. Yeah. Definitely going to talk about your moms. I didn't say your name in the intro because I didn't want to fuck up the pronunciation because people do that to my name all the time. Oworka. Oworka. And in Russian, it's Overko. Okay. Overko. Okay. Now, I haven't seen you in three years, as you just said. I got your phone number from your neighbor, James. <laughs> Risk, yeah. <laughs> yeah. He comes up to me at the Museum of Graffiti, shout out to Ket, and he's like, yo, I'm a friend of Aliash's. I'm going to call him right now. And I was like, hold on, son. <laughs> <laughs> Give me the number and let me call him. He, uh, he sent me the flick, and then I was like on the sofa doing something, and I just come off of a meeting, so I had my phone on vibrate. Uh -huh. And then he's like, yo, I'm here with your mans. And then I was like, oh shit, Talib, <laughs> tell him I say peace. And I was like, give that brother a hug for me. And the next thing I saw- You were making strangers hug me? <laughs> <laughs> two brothers that I, I have a lot of love for. So um, <laughs> next thing I saw, I saw the, the missed call. Right. So No doubt. Um, now, I was at the mu uh, Museum of Graffiti, which I did not know existed until they booked me to spin this party. Because I DJ now. I don't know if you knew that. Um, I didn't know that. I have a good time with it. I'm it's not that of... good of a DJ. I'm I'm a great selector. Same. I mean, that's that's the way it works. That's it's, right. It's like a therapeutic action. Getting people yeah. to dance, it's like... It's amazing. It's a, yeah. And I don't even have to rap to do it. I could play somebody else's <laughs> raps. Oh, man. I should have thought about this a long time ago. Um, but the uh, Museum of Graffiti was a beautiful place. Tell me about your connection to the graffiti world. So my mom is, uh, her, her degrees are in art history and art education. Mm -hmm. So I grew up in an arts household. And then when we moved to New York in 77, like graffiti immediately, like it was everywhere, especially mm -hmm. in the seventies, right? Mm -hmm. It was like literally on every surface. Mm -hmm. And it 
it was kind of, a, you know, you travel around the world and there's this thing where people are like, oh, graffiti, graffiti, graffiti. But it was kind of like a rite of passage in New York mm-hmm. in the 70s and 80s. So everybody had a tag, even if you were whack, even if you didn't pursue it, kind of everybody wrote kind yeah. of, even if it was in their notebook. Right. Um, but for me, figuring out a hand style was really important because I'm dyslexic. Mm. And so I would, shit would be backwards, upside down. And I'd be like, it's a P. And they'd be like, no, it's a Q. Wow. And you'd be like, no, it's a P. It's just, you know, potato or whatever. But wow. so You're developing like a hand style. Yeah. And, they, and just <laughs> I had busted handwriting. But graffiti gave me the discipline mm. um, to really pay attention. It was therapeutic as far as like dyslexia goes. Mm. That's dope. Um, That's really dope. And it, you know, it just led into so many other things. Um, you were raised in Brooklyn, and you assisted your mother in the restoration of ancient textiles. How did that early experience lead to your love for design and respect for materials? Wow. Uh, <laughs> it's a people's party, baby. Yeah, I love it. Um, <laughs> so we moved to New York because my mom uh, got a Rockefeller Fellowship at the Metropolitan Museum of Art at, wow. uh, in the Art Education Department. Mm. And later, she ended up... Um, getting a job as an assistant curator at Ed Marion Gallery, which is an ancient art gallery. Um, and there was a woman there who was a textile conservator. And my mom had textiles that my grand- her father brought back from World War II from the South Pacific. She asked the lady if she would restore them or, or mount them for, for us so she could put them up in the house. Mm-hmm. And the lady was like, well, I'll bring you in my studio and I'll show you how to do it because it's mm-hmm. really simple. These aren't really too messed up. So... I guess she was so impressed with my mom's work and assisting her that she hired her out of the gallery. So then, and then later she was like, look, there's not enough of us that do this in the world. You should go start your own studio. Mm -hmm. Um, And by proxy, in order to earn allowance, that's what I ended up doing. But also like, as far as like the fashion end of things. So it was always fascinating, like building things. I've always like built models and Legos and, and, was painting Dungeons and Dragons figures and stuff like that, like making nunchucks <laughs> and ninja stars, like making things always. Right. Um, but reweaving fabric and learning how to dye fabric was fascinating as a kid. A lot of people were like, that's some nerd shit. What's wrong with you? Mm-hmm. Um, but my mom also had a really interesting eye for fashion. And so mm-hmm. when Polo, a lot of people like look at Lowe now, but like in the seventies, like Lowe was whack. It was like preppy, right? Right. right. But my mom would always give me this like secondhand low stuff because we we didn't have a lot of money at the time. Um, my mom hit me to like low Jerbo, like early Jerbo jeans, like that was currency on the streets back then. Yeah, and, jeans. and like I was like, this is bananas. What is this? This French stuff. It's like, French. I want Lees. Right. And she, <laughs> and she was like, no, these are Jerbos. She's just always been a big influence. So I guess through my mom, and then um, being in New York and having to look fresh to be accepted Mm -hmm. is a really big thing, right? So when we got to New York, I had a really unkempt afro. It was usually flat on one side and I wore high waters and 69ers and like a weird Mork for Mork shirt. And kids were like, the fuck are you? Like, (laughs) Stripes? Yeah, this, you know, striped (laughs) shirt. And my jeans were like hemmed, like let down a bunch of times Mm -hmm. because we lived in Massachusetts first. So that culture didn't exist. You get tired of getting made fun of. And my mom started to pick up the fashion game. Mm -hmm. Um, So she dressed me the best she could. And I just had different stuff. But, you know, I figured it out. The intersection is funny what you just said. I chuckled when you said Dungeons and Dragons because shout out to 88 Keys. He is the intersection of Polo and and D&D. That's dope. Because 88 Keys called me the other day. And he's like, yo, I got to tell you about this thing I've been doing. It changed my life. I spent all this money. I got new friends. And it's really <laughs> it's really impacted my life. I thought he was about to tell me about like a self-help book. Right. He's like, I played Dungeons and Dragons. And I'm like, the game? Mm. He's like, yeah, have you heard of it? I'm like, 88. What, what the fuck are you talking about? <laughs> so I sent him a clip of the Marla Wayans okay. Dungeons and Dragons movie. Okay. There's a scene like when Marlon is making a joke. And he's like, what's this? I'm like, it's the Dungeons and Dragons movie starring Marlon Wayans. You've never seen this? I've never seen it. It sounds amazing. But yeah, shout out to 88 Keys because he definitely, he was like, yo, do you still hang out with Rubik's and Juju? I'm like, why? He's like, I want to invite y'all over to play Dungeons and Dragons. <laughs> it's a lot of fun. It's a, it takes a long time. <laughs> um, and definitely uh, high attention spam. 
I'm going to give you 88's number. I'm sure y'all will have a lot of fun. All right, dope. I'm a fan. So. Yeah. I met you through John Forte, our mutual friend. Peace, we just John. had a great conversation about John. He's my favorite people. One of my favorite people of all time. Um, when you got on in fashion, we felt like we were on. Mm. And when I met you, you were producing John Forte's music. And you were working with Yasin Bey in Minnesota and Moneyball's Players. So tell me about your time as a hip-hop producer. Because it's not a lot about <laughs> yeah, that out there in the world. Um, how'd that start? I wanted, I started wanting, like, I wanted to rap. Mm -hmm. I sucked at rapping. <laughs> um, obviously, I have a huge love for music. Again, like, the, the parental thing, like, my mom inherited my dad's record collection, mm -hmm. and just the breadth of both of their music collections was incredible. So I would just nerd out. And mm -hmm. then when, when sampling arrived, it was like, oh, it's on. So you had, had that sample knowledge in your head because you had these records in your Yeah, and as soon as I found out what a sampler was, I was like, oh, I got a, a loop here, I got a loop here, there's this, you know. Uh, um, but, you know, I was ready. I was right. like, I'm armed, let's do right. this. And then my man Fish, Rick Nar, I started making like little loop tapes or whatever. Fish introduced me to Af from- Baby Bam? Yeah, okay. from the Jungle Brothers. He liked what I was doing. And so they put me in the studio. It was me, Juju, and Les uh, in- um, That's the beat nuts for everybody sorry, who doesn't know what he's me. talking about. He's going too deep there. Um, my bad. <laughs> Juju and Les from the beat nuts. And we were in uh, Bill Laswell's studio. Mm -hmm. That place was just magical because there was like, I was already a music nerd and he was playing me stuff from like, um, like unreleased stuff of like James Brown and Jimi Hendrix. Mm. Like, that he I'd has like to hear that. The, on two inch tape, like insane stuff. Mm -hmm. He he produced most of the celluloid stuff. A lot of people don't know that. He's the one that introduced um, DST to Herbie Hancock. Wow. He's high key responsible for a lot of shit that wow. changed the game and he never gets credit for. Mm. Wow. Um, he was just like, he introduced us to so much stuff. Like, he's like, whatever you need. One day, like, we're chilling out and like, like right. Maceo walks in and you're just like, that's Maceo. Bernie Worrell would come in and like record a bunch of key things. And you're just like, What's Hold crazy up. about like, those names is that Maceo was working with Dela. Bernie went on to work with Yassine. These are, these are pioneers of funk and soul who kept coming around in the hip hop space. Right. I just was a sponge, man. Like even in, in making beats, just watching like Juju and Les like go to town. I didn't um, know that you were in the studio with them. That makes yeah. more sense now. It was incredible. Mm -hmm. Like I learned so much during that time. And it was like a that record took about three years to come out because there were so many uh, creative distractions, if mm -hmm. you will. Like yeah. I feel like we all learned a lot of shit, yeah. but it the Warner Brothers people were definitely pissed. So I got I think I got one track on the record. Okay. Even though I produced like 12. Right. Like we just kept making stuff and making stuff and then they had to boil it down. Right. Um, I, yeah. And then went on and um, Yasin and I met because we both lived on Bergen Street. That's the crib I used to come to on Bergen Street. Right. And then John later moved down the block from my old crib on Bergen between Bond and Evans. Um, and I don't even remember how John and I met. That's horrible. <laughs> I feel like a shitty person right now. But um, obviously one of the most talented MCs. Like, John brought me to that house on Bergen Street, and in the intro, I said that you were sort of an architect from my outlook on life, and that's absolutely true. And it was you. at your mother's house. It was at that house on Bergen. I couldn't believe what I was seeing happen in that house. Hmm. Was it because it was my introduction to the 5% way of life, and a lot of gods and earths, peace to the gods and earths. Peace to the gods and earths. Peace earth. to your brother Virtuous. Peace, uh, Virtuous. You know, uh, it's funny, I just sent him, I found an old picture of me and him in like 92, mm -hmm. and I just sent it to him this morning. Peace, Let's virtuous. Do. Peace, virtuous. Now, your mother is white. She is. And my experience with the gods and the earths at that point was this was a pro-black, and for, in terms of my mind, well, it's no white people allowed. Sure. But here we are in this white woman's house right. building with the gods and earths. Right. And it really opened up my worldview as, okay, I can be pro-black, and I can have these thoughts and I can look at the world this way, mm. but it doesn't mean I have to be at odds with white people. So break down that existence. You know, well, there's a huge misconception, right? Mm -hmm. um, the father would say, you know, 
were neither pro-black nor Mm anti-white. Obviously, I was intrigued because it was a pro-black space (laughs) on the front end, and that's a very contradictory contradictory statement. But I was looking for something, right? Mm -hmm. I think my mom was very supportive um, with two main things that were game changers. Or three, graffiti, even though she was like, don't get caught and don't get arrested. Mm -hmm. Skateboarding, because it was such a creative community. And me getting the knowledge of myself because it, it, I was a high school dropout. I'm dyslexic. Mm-hmm. I kind of just would quit stuff. I'm good at things. Anything I apply myself to, I excel at, but I would just quit. I just mm-hmm. feel like, ah, this is disinteresting. When I encountered the gods, there was a sense of self accountability mm-hmm. and finishing things mm-hmm. and keeping your word. Your word is your bond, mm-hmm. yes, right? Sir. And that's exactly what that's about. If you don't, if you're not going to do it, don't say it. Mm-hmm. Um, I I know that had I not gotten the knowledge of myself, I wouldn't be where I was because I wasn't follow, I wouldn't follow through with anything. Mm. I just think like, oh, I know I can do that. It's mm-hmm. like yeah, you can know you can do it, but if you don't do it, it doesn't mean anything. It's just potential. It's not kinetic. Yeah. Um, I know. Kind of. I didn't. I hope I didn't skirt around the the question. No. Um, Self accountability, man. Righteousness, living a righteous life, being a righteous human being, not self-righteous, uh, being mindful. There's a lot of things that we learned that I see now in the like the men's self-help space, like <laughs> fasting. Like right. before we got lessons or mathematics and alphabets, we had to fast for three days. Right. Right. So I'd fast three days for every three days every month. May. Right. So Master Allah, why? Like so they have no fat November. Like. All May, you you weren't fucking, you weren't jerking off, like um, they call it spaghetti month. So <laughs> spaghetti month. Yeah. It's, <laughs> so I look, I look at the the space now, but it it, it taught me self discipline. Mm-hmm. Oh. Um, right. And and it's a very misunderstood space. Mm-hmm. A lot of people look at it as a religion, and for some people, right, wrong, or differently, it is a religion. Um, yeah. But it's more of a school of thought. That's why I refer to it as a way of life because I'm not someone who identifies as 5%, but I would be remiss if I didn't completely acknowledge the impact that that community has and continues to have over my life. There probably wouldn't be hip hop if it wasn't for the guys. I mean, you look at like Raheem, Grandmaster Flash of Fears 5, like- so many of the gods, like those were the first the, best. The MCs. b-boy stance is yeah. people standing on their square. That's right. You know, like word um, is bond or comes from that. Our all our, our language. Right. Yeah. Big Daddy Kane, Rakim, like the best. The, the list best goes MC. on. I made a LL Cool J, Jay Z too. Jay Z's recent work is like, yeah. If I, you go back to the originators, right. Jay Z and Jazzo, they were. Yeah, Jazzo was part of the Ansar community for a while, but I'm sure. I mean, you couldn't not. You couldn't be a young man in New York in the '70s, '80s, and not encounter the gods. That's right. And the impact, especially within hip hop, all of the innovators, not all, but you know, what I'm saying, like on the front end, of most things, of the important ones, right? Yeah. Um, and the people that changed the paradigm um, were the gods. Word up. All right, so tell if you're going to learn another new thing about me. I actually had a skating phase. Okay. When I moved in, out to L.A., I just, like, kept trying to redefine myself, and I felt like I wanted to do, like, the punk rock skating thing. So I, I had a banana board. Okay. And um, I stopped because I don't know everyone knows Universal, that long hill. That's at like when you're walking out of Universal headed to the train station. I tried to skate down that hill and almost killed myself. And that's when I was like, all right, enough is enough. Universal where? Universal Studios. I know you you had a skating phase when you moved to to LA. LA, Yes. Oh, so as like an adult. I I was an adult. Okay. Where did you move? I was in my late twenties. Um, I moved here from Florida. Dope. Where in Florida? All right. Yeah, I'm from New York, but I moved here from Miami. I like Miami. I I just when I moved here, I just wanted to like try different things, and I was like, oh, okay, I'm gonna be a skater for a summer. I was a skater and I used to go to Venice Beach and go and I wasn't good, but you know, it was fun. You <laughs> as long as you're having fun. Sk- right. You were a skater. And how did a kid growing up in the 80s and 90s from Brooklyn or in Brooklyn get into skating? So, again, like we didn't have a lot of bread. When we lived in Massachusetts, we used to go to the Cape because it was just a thing that you did. Like, and my mom grew up go- going to the Cape. She's from Boston or Norwood mm-hmm. originally. Um, and so the ocean's like a big deal in my family. And she had friends that were had a bunch of bread and they had a guest house in the back of their house in Fire Island. So we would rent that. 
and we'd go out there every weekend. In the summer, I'm like, this is from age 12 to 17, say. Mm -hmm. We would rent their back house. I ended up meeting uh, Paul Middleman, a guy named Alistair McKevitt, who's from Santa Monica, but his family's originally from New York. Mm -hmm. uh, Jake Burlingham, who's from Boston, punker kid from Boston, and Greg Gomery. Um, and they all skateboarded. And I was like, this is the coolest shit ever. So I'm like 14 and I hated sports. My mom would be like, oh, go and play. But I'd be like, I don't, I'm not doing push-ups for anybody. Fuck you. <laughs> like <laughs> little fun. Billy missed the, missed the goal. Fuck him. <laughs> I'm, I'm definitely not doing push-ups for his ass. Right. And skateboarding was dope. And mm -hmm. it would be, and I was also like kind of awkward. And skateboarding afforded me freedom to explore my own um, athleticism. Mm -hmm. Because in order to make a trick, you can't blame it on any, you can't blame it on little Billy who didn't make the goal. You had to be self-sufficient. absolutely self yeah. It's completely autonomous. And the support group amongst peers is like, dude, you made it, you made the ollie, you figured it out, you figured out how to do 360. And so I had to become agile in order to get good or do the things I wanted to do on a skateboard. Um, and that's, after that is when I decided, like, I got in, I actually got good at sports. Mm -hmm. I, like, started playing running back okay. on a two-hand touch wow, league. After okay. After skateboarding. So it's the reverse story, because usually there's this whole anti-jock thing. Uh, um, cement football, the two-hand touch. Yeah. There's been a lot of talk about the early connections of skateboard culture and hip-hop culture, as depicted in the movies Kids and the recent documentary The Streets Are Silent. Can you talk to us about the rap kid and skate kid and how it merged it, and diverged as you were coming up? It's a lot less sensationalist. Um, there was a handful of us that rode skateboards. It was different than the West Coast because the West Coast already had a, a, a skateboard culture, mm -hmm. like a you know, 20, 30 years deep skateboard culture. Um, in New York, people would just be like, it wasn't like a racial thing either because people didn't know what a skateboard was. Mm. It wasn't like, oh, that's some white boy shit. They were just like, what is that? And what are you doing? Um, we used to put a jump ramp at the ball court in Gowanus Projects. Mm. Um, and they would be like, do it again. Like, That's where they filmed clockers at, um, Gowanus. And we would skate there every day. And dudes would just be like, the drug deal, everybody would just be like, That's dope. What is that? That's some wild shit. It wasn't, it was mm. never like, Oh, that's some white boy shit. But with the hip hop space, a lot of graffiti writers, the early 70s graffiti writers from New York, skateboarded. Mm. Um, and then we would just skate to the club. Like it sounds funny, but it was such an alien thing. Now it's like a, an everyday thing, but like I brought my skate, well, a bunch of dudes used to throw a party in tunnel, but I like skated to hip hop clubs. Like we used to skate, we would do, we'd meet in Washington Square Park. So everybody'd be like emceeing mm -hmm. or b-boying and skateboarding, all the punk kids. Like it was the epicenter of subculture, right? We'd meet there, we'd skate, we'd go to the Brooklyn Banks, then we'd go to a matinee at CBGB's. So you'd mm -hmm. see like- Punk shit. Bad Brains or mm -hmm. Youth of Today or whomever. And then later, Jessica used to throw, Jessica and Lano used to throw a thing called Payday. I remember. And we would go skate to Payday. And that's like a real thing. Like it's not an exaggerated yeah. like, and that was, but there's a lot of cats that would skate and rogue graffiti and that were involved in like punk rock and or hip hop. Sasha Jenkins, Shout perfect Sasha. example. Yeah, that's my man. But where are you man. putting your skateboards at the club in coat check? Or are you just, just holding them it. and dancing <laughs> with just them? Just have it with you. Just carry it. You're too young to worry about like, and you're like, any girl that gives a fuck if I have a skateboard, I don't need her. I had a skateboard <laughs> around that time, you know, because I, I was in Park Slope. And, right. um, it's funny you said Jessica because her name comes up so much on the show because I used to right. work for her with John right. Forte. And she managed John. She managed John. Right. I had a skateboard before I was going to the clubs. Right. But my skateboard was very functional. I never learned a trick. Mm. Couldn't do an ollie, couldn't jump over Doesn't anything. Matter. As long as you have fun. I used to skate two things. Yeah. Get on my skateboard and go to the store or go yeah. to my friend's house. And um, I remember buying like Thrasher magazine back then mm. and reading it and be like, oh, this is a whole thing. But I remember having like Thrasher t-shirts and, and having Vans. But now on, on this show, right, I, I, I bought a Thrasher hoodie right. a year ago. And somebody was like, you don't skate? Why you got a Thrasher shirt on? Yeah, people get All real. All the comments. Yeah. You poser. Yeah. All the fucking comments. So I'm like, 
Yo, man. And it's always some motherfuckers that weren't there. <laughs> you weren't there, man. You weren't there. You so were skating with me in the gym. Here's, <laughs> the beauty about skateboarding, like, and here's where it gets fucked up. Mm-hmm. And one of the reasons my mom advocated skateboarding so much is that it's a creative community mm-hmm. that supports itself. Yeah. And it's, it's built its own right. industry. It's not even like an NFL of skating. Right. It's just these it's kids. It's like hip hop, yeah. right? It's like, well, we got this thing. It's growing. Oh, you know a record pressing plant? You know a studio? You know a guy that makes beats? I got you. Now it's a little weirder, right? Same mm-hmm. thing with skateboarding. It, it was a space that knew that it was going to grow right. and people supported it. The other end is that nobody cares if you're good or not. Or good, like good's a relative term. Mm-hmm. Like as long as you're fucking having fun, mm-hmm. that's all that matters. Right. There's cats that like just cruise around. They're not even longboarders, like just cats at crews that have like, you know, however many million followers or whatever, Mm -hmm. hundreds, you know, like, because they're just fucking having fun. You know what I mean? They're Mm -hmm. not like, they don't need to jock out or be like jumping off of fucking buildings or a mega ramp or whatever. Mm -hmm. They're just enjoying themselves. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's a feeling. Yeah. And that's what makes you a skateboarder. Thank you. See, I'm not a poser. No. So, no. So, not by a long shot. uh, Speaking of the uh, connections, Jared, who directed that uh, 1999 video? I just put that on the playlist. Oh, Sorry. That song. <laughs> Betsy Blakemore? I think it was Betsy, who was working at Zoo York at the time, yeah. right? So it was like, these Zoo York people are directing raucous videos. That's dope. And it's rest in peace to Harold Hunter. Yeah. Yep. It was them who decided to put Harold Hunter in the video. And that video and connects these worlds. Like, I'm connected to the skate world because of that that music video. That's dope. And because of my songs, The Blast Get By, those songs from that era end up on these skate videos from that era. Speaking about Harold, so I, I'd come back from California. I was, this is the advent. Harold's an interesting point and everybody tries to own him because mm-hmm. he's passed, mm-hmm. unfortunately. Um, he's a really beautiful human being. Yes, indeed. Um, so I'd come back from California and I was living with Bosco. Bosco Money from Downtown Science. Look, this is my next question. And I forgot- Bosco was one of the first famous rappers I knew. What was it like <laughs> living with Bosco Money as roommates? So I, I have to backtrack to an earlier statement. Bosco's actually who taught me how to make beats. Shout out mm. to Bosco. I haven't yeah, seen Bosco him since Money, that era. Ken Carabello, yeah. Downtown Science, Shout Sam, out to Sam Sever, Sever, who also never gets his flowers. That's like, right. My Adidas. That's right. All in All by Joy Sims. Yeah. Like joints, heavy, 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 yeah, heavy Sam joints. Sam Sever like, was He's a beast. It. Like and never yeah. gets his flowers. Thank you, Sam. And thank you, Bosco. Yes. Um, I'm living with Bosco and I get a job at, at Skate NYC, which is a skate shop in the Lower East Side. Harold lives in the projects immediately adjacent. Mm-hmm. I'm skating for Blockhead Skateboards at the time. And I'm getting these boxes of like five, six boards a month. I'm used to riding like one board for every eight months, mm-hmm. right? So I'd just give some to Harold because he was good and he really enjoyed skateboarding. And that's how he and I met. And then later he ended up going riding for Shut and then Eli put him on Zoo or Eli and Rod put him on Zoo. Mm-hmm. And Shut, Shut Skates is the first skateboard company in New York, right? Mm. And you were doing, before that, you were doing like punk rock flyers around this time? Like, yeah, like straight edge hardcore flyers. Okay. <laughs> like I was definitely- like which and, and ska flyers. Uh, so Luke, Luke Abbey, who's the drummer for, or, I mean, tr- plays, played drums for a bunch of bands, but like Gorilla Biscuits, maybe Warzone for a little while. Luke and Sammy are like the, they play drums for everybody. Okay. But Luke was in a band called Loud and Boisterous. And so I like did some flyers for them. And then in high school, I did a bunch of ska flyers because I was like rude boy, skinhead kid, like traditional skinhead, the toasters, the second step. Um, trying to think what other, like, I don't know. <laughs> yeah. I, I have a lot of stuff in the basement and I forget and people remind me about things. No doubt. I did the triple five soul logo while I was working at Skate You NYC. did that logo? The original logo. Wow. So the, the, while I was the, working the at Skate NYC. One? It's like a big five with like a Roman numeral five. Okay. The one prior to the cursive one. Where she was doing like the tie hats. Yep. <laughs> Sorry, that's. Anyway, <laughs> but yes. um, I, I just forget shit. That's a good segue Sorry. to go into um, the fashion world. R.I.P. to Dom, first of all. Man. And foremost. Yeah. Yes, indeed. Um, Fat Farm. Now, you were 
the designer of Fat Farm. You plugged in with Russell, right? Because of Dom. Because of Dom, yeah. right? This is around the time that I started to get to know you. Yeah. And it was like, I remember being very happy that my friend was doing this work. But then there was like this big blow up at Fat Farm and you were no longer there. Because I was young and an asshole. What happened? Uh, <laughs> um, backtrack. So Dom and I were hung out tough like that was my main dude and mm -hmm. he was in a group called key west so it was okay. him and kyle west and kyle was producing all the i'll be sure stuff okay and dom was doing a lot of um street consulting for andre harrell rest in peace rest in peace to um, andre. champagne and bubele word <laughs> we just and saw um yesterday. so dom's actually the dude that put the versace shades on biggie true, okay. true story yeah, because he was exotic Dom. Like, he would have, like, wild shit. Like, we were all still rocking low in Timberland, and Dom would have, like, a Gautier sweater and, like, right. Versace. And, like, he'd be like, oh, I'm going to a, a, a Valentino sample sale. And we'd be like, what the fuck <laughs> is that? that? Right. Like, and so I, I have to give a lot of my, like, style credit to, to Dom. Mm. Dom and Heather Worley, a woman I dated in high school. But... um. So Dom is like going to the parties and, you know, he's like rubbing elbows with everybody. And one day- This is around the time I was working for Jessica. So I remember seeing right. Dom as a huge presence. Yeah. And, at this. yeah. and he just had that air about him, mm -hmm. right? He was boxing and shit, like mm -hmm. on top of his shit. So Dom, we would always talk about like the phenomena, phenomenon of low, right? And how there were, excuse me, Polo Ralph Lauren. Um, <laughs> And how there were low lives, and there was a whole culture built around people like that collected mm -hmm. uh, Ralph Lauren, and how interesting it was that the the target demographic was upper middle upper middle class and upper class white America, mm -hmm. right? But in our lens, living in the city, it was black, brown, and yellow people That's consuming right. and or liberating. That's um, right. And so. <laughs> That's right. Um, that's right, it, it, rushing the low mansion. <laughs> right. So um, boosting culture. We were like, how cool would it be if somebody like made a brand for for the city that lived in that space? And it was also the advent of J. Crew. J. Crew was still like a um a mail order catalog. They didn't have stores yet. And one day he hit me up and he was like, Yo, I was at this party last night and I ran into Russell and he he wants to start a brand and he wants to call it fat. And I was like, well, that's dumb. It's like, you might as well call it fresh or dope or, right. you know, whatever the, the new colloquial right. term was. He's like, he needs a designer. You should do it. And I was like, I, like, I have ideas, but I don't have to design clothes. So I hit up Paul Middleman um, and asked him to look at some, some of his, he was in FIT at the time. And he was working for Stussy, but he was at a FIT. And his aunt and my mom were best friends. Mm -hmm. Karen and my, his aunt Karen and my mom were like really tight. So Dom and I like went to this Jamaican restaurant on Flatbush at 4th. I forgot, I think it's called like Sunsplash or something like that. Flatbush and 4th, wow. It's not there anymore. Right, right, right. Uh, and we sat and he was like, you're going to draw this line. Like he made me do it. Like he was like, you're going to draw fat. And I was like, we should call it Fat Farm because Polo Country had just started and it was mm. before Double RL. It's a precursor to Double RL. And it, so it had a green label and it was like... It just looked cool. It was like more like double RL ish. Right. And um, that's a horrible way to <laughs> describe it. But anyway, um, we drew Fat Farm, or I drew Fat Farm. And Dom and I just ideated for like two hours in this Jamaican restaurant. Um, and then the next day, we brought it to Russell. And he's like, I love it. You're the guy. And I was yes. like, What? <laughs> I'm right. a high school dropout. I've never been to like design school. So they hired a bunch of people um, that were technical designers. And then I did, you know, I was like, well, I barely know how to use a laptop or a computer. Not laptops barely existed at the time. This is 91, 92. Um, so I was like, we need a graphic artist and we need somebody that knows the fashion industry. So Paul Middleman had his dad, do you remember Pandemonium uptown? Mm -mm. So Paul's dad grew up or was partners or crew with the dudes that had started Unique okay. and the dudes that had started Canal Jean and Antique Boutique. Like I that was a Unique whole and like- Antique Boutique and Canal Jean. I was living in those spots. Yeah, yeah, no doubt. So that was all the same crew of people. Mm -hmm. So Ron Middleman, mm -hmm. 
made a store uptown called Pandemonium, but it was the same crew. It'd be like me, you, and John, and and Yasin, and and any adjacent crew. It was like, yo, I'm gonna do my thing. And Paul grew up in that space, right? So he knew. So I was like, we should hire Paul. So Paul kind of became the art director, kind of the guy that knew how to speak the language of of apparel, but, but you know, was still kind of working with Stussy. And then Eli, and Eli was a graphic artist. And that's the advent of Fat Farm. And then they, they f- it was fucked up because Dom's position was supposed to be the marketing director and Russell fucked him out of that. Mm. And I'm forever bitter about that. Now, did you leave Fat Farm before Baby Fat? No, I I came up with the name. Okay, what? so you came up with Baby Fat. Which is fucked up. Right. Like, in the, like, what's her face? You know, Baby Fat like, is back. Yeah. It's not <laughs> what's, fully. What's, what's old girl's name? She's like, oh, uh, I invented that in a dream. Like, <laughs> no. She had a dream about That's Ali cool. uh That's all right. <laughs> Hilarious. That's cool. All right. So I love San Diego. I'm there all the time. Shout out to Madhouse Comedy Club. All right. Um, yes. I, I, I love the city, especially the beaches. But it's easy it is, living. Yes. But it is a city that can sometimes get stuck in time with the beach towns and still is very 90s. Um, it seems a little bit of a surprise <laughs> <You're not wrong. laughs> for a prog- progressive designer to live there. What made you pick San Diego? I didn't pick it. So after Fat Farm, and we didn't. I didn't talk about my departure from Fat Farm. I, oh, you know, yeah. young and feel free to share. You said it's because you were young and stupid. Yeah, I just like I didn't agree with Russell, and I was very vocal. And it's kind of like something Jared and I were talking about earlier, <laughs> where you're just like, "Fuck you! I don't. You don't. You know. Right. You don't know." Right. I'm the ear to the street, that shit. <laughs> and um, I would kind of like clown his, he had like a bunch of yes men around him mm. and we would have these meetings and I'd be like, you're wearing a fucking jail suit. Right. Real, like real you quick. just shaved your head because Run DMC just shaved their heads <laughs> and they shaved their heads because Onyx shaved their heads. Right. That's corny. Like, <laughs> he gave me the <laughs> origin stories. Anyway, quick, and I would you, just say shit like that. Before I was you very, continue. You spoke so, your mind. Before you continue, um, on my debut album with Raucous, we have Michael Rappaport playing a record executive. Okay. Right? Like a Lior. He's kind of doing a Lior thing, right. but he doesn't have the voice. Right. And the story, the things that he's saying to me on the album uh-huh. are things that I told him that Russell said to me. Mm. Russell would say some wild because shit. Because I had a meeting with Russell, right. right, to do the hip hop summits or whatever. Right. And he, I had a meeting. My meeting was right after Jinx the Juvenile. Okay. Russell thought that I was Jinx the Juvenile's manager, mm. right? I brought us both in the meeting together, <laughs> right? And he's like, yeah, you know, he's telling Jinx the Juvenile who had just got shot. Right. He's like, you can't be out here in the streets because you're going to die. And he's like, yo, bring in, the, bring in this guy. He brings in a guy with some fucked up teeth and he says hi. And then the guy leaves. So see that, see that guy's teeth? He was a thug in my neighborhood. Now oh, he works for me. My God. Right? Then he's like... Then he's like, you can't, but you can't be a weirdo like those most deaf and common type niggas. You can't be like that. And you're sitting I'm there? I'm sitting there. The <laughs> that, why I got shit canned is he would say shit like that to me and I'd be like, who the fuck cares? <laughs> right. Like, I'd be like, you're so disconnected. Like, what are Did you, you talking Did you hear about? this story about him? But it would be in front of his staff. Yeah. And so then I'm embarrassing a, him. a full room when he said like, these things you got to go. Like, are, are you a Libra? I'm a Leo. A Leo. Okay, I couldn't find your birthday anywhere. I'm the sure. water. No, have you ever heard the story of Ru- Russell uh, inflating the fat farm numbers to get more money? Oh yeah, he. I don't. Even, okay, okay. I don't fuck with dude. At he all. said fat farm did a hundred million. We were we so we boiled down to we were gonna fight. Oh, at, this fight, uh, at, Russell Simmons at Time Cafe in his like yoga said, pose. So I ended up like getting locked up <laughs> overnight. <laughs> I ended up getting locked up overnight on our day, like our like we had this like launch party thing, uh-huh. and then um, a couple of days later we were at Time Cafe, and he was like, "How was lockup?" And I was like, <gasps> "I'll fuck you up." And he was like, <laughs> "I've been to jail he was like, now." What? And he kind of stood up, and I was like, "Don't, don't, don't mm-hmm. do that." And I bagged him down, and then the next day, like, what's her name? Um, his assistant. She was so sweet. She was really nice. Like she was like, "Yeah." Um, uh, <laughs> you gotta go. Yeah. <laughs> Cause I embarrassed him in Time Cafe. Cause I and was then, like, I'll bust your ass. Like, you need to sit the fuck down. And you went all the way to San Diego? How did you get oh, there? Oh, so the San Diego thing. <laughs> Sorry. So the and San then Diego, I got on the plane. Yeah. So then after I went up this I long tangent to about <laughs> trying to bust Russell's ass. Um, so <laughs> um, I end up, man, this is fucked up. So I started a skateboard company called American Dream Incorporated, which mm-hmm. is. Basically about, it's the, you know, 
playing on the American dream. And it's basically Ron, Ron Allen and I, who's one of my heroes, mm -hmm. black skateboarder under deluxe distribution. And most of the graphics are like Panther graphics. We have a black Jesus board. Um, I'm like, we're going in politically. Mm -hmm. At the same time, Phil Pabone, oh, rest man. in peace. Rest in peace And to thank Phil. you so much, Phil. Man, rest in peace uh, to Phil I don't Pabone. speak to the dead, but to, to the people that love him, uh, thank you. So Phil hits me because he used to manage the JBs. Mm -hmm. He used to manage the Jungle Brothers. And he's like, are you still designing? And I'm like, you know, I got the skateboard thing going on. He's like, because we're, we're leaving Mecca. Mm. Um, and we don't want to be shitty. We want to like bring in people to design. So he brought me and uh, Emmett Harrell was already there. Uh, Bobby Joseph, um, Juka Evans. Juka Evans is like the primary at the time. Then my second cousin, Kareem Campbell, calls me like a year later and he's like, what are you doing? And he's skating for a company called Drawers. And Drawers Clothing is where DC, the oh. DC comes from, comes from Drawers Clothing. Mm -hmm. So there's a, a holding company called Circus, Dis Circus Distribution. I've d developed a weird lisp at age 51. <laughs> um, and Circus has a, an outerwear company, a snowboard company called Dub mm -hmm. and a clothing company called Drawers. Shout and, out to Ken Block. Yeah, and Damon Way. Mm -hmm. And best employers I've ever had, by the way. Mm -hmm. Like, I learned so much from them. Um, so Reem's like, they, they're they looking for designers, and I think you're the guy. Because um, I was a huge outerwear nerd. I lived in tent and trails, like, mm -hmm. tent collect, trails. yeah. Paragon and all yeah, that. Yeah, all that. So it Paragon, Paragon Weekly mm -hmm. and tent and trails weekly. Um, Assistant managers. Mm -hmm. Nice. Didn't you, you dated an assistant manager? <laughs> That's a whole other conversation. Um, so, so. <laughs> the tea you had, is spilling that's over. Why, that's why you had all the Vasques and A solos. You remember this? Of course. I had so many A solo Vasques, <laughs> hiking shoes. Anyway, so they're like, come out to Vegas. There's, it's magic. Let's have a conversation. We sit down. They're like, do you know how to design outerwear? I'm like, I love outerwear. I was trying to do like a whole project for, for Mecca with outerwear and they, they shot me down. Mm -hmm. um, I obviously grew up skateboarding so I, and I snowboarded and they're like, how much are you making? And I told them how much I was making and they're like, we'll double it. And I was like, fuck you, New York, bye. Right. Like, and I just bounced. To San Diego. Yeah. Yeah. And they, my mom bought the house in Harlem and I was like, I need like two, three months where I'll go back and forth to get my mom moved uptown. Um, and they were like, cool. And then uh, they doubled my pay and I was just out. And the cost of living in San Diego in 97 was like a fraction of what it was in New York. Yeah, my, coming from Brooklyn and the or weather. Harlem? Yeah, yeah. So my yeah. buddy and I had a, um, and it, New York was still cheap at the time, right? Like we could have bought the house, the, the other house on Bergen, the, the actually the house that you were in, between fourth and fifth was 50 racks wow. Wow. in 97. Wow. You get there and now, now it's like a million wow. dollar house. It's like 1.5, maybe two. So Bergen between fourth and fifth. See, and that's right on the edge because once you pass fifth, you're in Park Slope. Oh, you're in Park Slope. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? It's funny because I go back and people are like, there's like the new 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 York kids and like, yo, what's up, money? And you're like, you're from fucking Minnesota. Shut the fuck up. Oh, yeah. And then they're like, they're like, where are you from? And I'm like, Bergen Street. And they're like, Bergen what? And you're <laughs> like, oh God, I'm gonna choke you in a minute. And then, <laughs> and then it's like, oh, the Bergen between fourth and fifth and like the South Slope. And they're like, now I'm gonna choke you because it's never you're, been the South now Slope. Now you're using real estate right. jargon. And it's never been the South Slope. It's downtown Brooklyn. That's right. Anyway, so I moved to San Diego. My buddy and I, Kelly Bird, who was pro for real, he just ended his pro career, became the team manager for DC. He and I had a loft. It was like, 1,800 square feet, and we paid 1,200 bucks. What the fuck? Yeah, and we built a wall. It was that big. Like, it was like 20-foot ceilings. We were chilling. You couldn't tell me shit. Like, <laughs> um, and I was snowboarding every weekend. Hanging Where out were you there. snowboarding at? Uh, Mammoth and Big Bear. And every once, every other month, we would go out to Snowbird in Utah. Now, speaking of it snowboarding. Was cragging. Like, I was like, bye, New York. Mm -hmm. Speaking of snowboarding, we're going to have Salema here. 
Master Keller, your good friend. Man, that's my brother. Later on right today. There. And they're not going to know that because I'm going to have a whole different outfit. It's going to feel like a whole <laughs> different day when you watch it. It's a different day. <laughs> yes, it's a whole different thing. But this is a good friend of yours, and he was a marketing person at Alpha Numeric. He was a marketing director. Director, when you started Alpha Numeric. Yeah. So tell us about those days. So I'm working for, uh, for Circus Distribution. So it's dubbed DC and Drawers. And, um, I really wanted to make a documentary about the history of black skateboarding. So this is 97, mm-hmm. 98. And um, automatically, because to your point, San Diego is, uh, it's not void of culture. It's just not as culturally enriched or diverse as some other places we lived. It has a lot of its own culture, which is fantastic. But so I automatically gravitated to a lot of brothers that were there. So mm-hmm. oh, Salema, uh, Akko and Atiba Jefferson were still living in San Diego. Damon Morris, Sal Barbier was still living in San Diego. Mm-hmm. Mirko Mangum, I'm trying to think who else. So we would meet up once a week and kind of brainstorm about this documentary we wanted to make um, and who were pertinent characters in this history of black skateboarding. Mike Alesco, again, rest in peace, who was the, the I don't know, he ran Mecca. And, and um, the holding company, International News, when I left to go work for Dub and DC and Drawers, he was like, promise me we'll work together in the future. And I was like, all right. Like, and I respected him. He's somewhat of a mentor and just a really great human being. But so when I was at Dub, I was sending stuff to like, so Bilal, Bilal Law, not the singer, right. Bilal that did the Palace Records. And, Bilal Law? Yeah. In LA. He was in LA, he's in New York, okay. right? Um, we went to high school together. His story is fascinating. So he managed Wu for a little bit. He ran Palace Records for a little bit. Um, and now he's just a principal. But at the, um, I would send stuff to him and he would lace Wu. And then I would send stuff to, to Juju and Les, send stuff to you, know, you and John and, um, and uh, Yasin. And so Ju and Les, I forget which one is wearing a dub jacket on the cover of Stone Crazy. Oh, okay. But that, that's something I sent them. Okay. So they're like, how are you doing this from San Diego? So then Mike calls me, or Bobby, he hits Bobby Joseph up. Bobby Joseph calls me and is like, Mike wants to talk to you about starting a brand, working together again. I'm like, I want to do this brand called Alphanumeric, Mathematics and Alphabets. Right, there goes the God influence. Right. So that's why it's always alphanumeric. Thanks you, mm-hmm. peace. Everything's math and alphabets oriented, education, self-education, self-sufficiency oriented. And Mike and I have this conversation. He's like, do you want to do it? And I'm like, yes. So Salema was like the first dude that I was like, yo, I'm going to do this thing. Are you down? Right. Sorry, it was a very long-winded answer. No doubt. No, but- you're answering. You're, 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 listen, you're good. You're it's dead. beautiful. Um, and- I was bugging because I grew up in a fella Hugh Masakela house. Mm. Like, you so know, to see the and so I was like, wait, what? Like, yeah. he was like, yeah, my name's Sal. He used to call himself Sal at the time. Yes, he did. And he was like, all right, Sal. Well, Sal, what? And they're like, Masakela. And I was like, Vroom. like, <laughs> right. you know, just, uh, it was like, hold up. Like, right. That's your pops? Yeah. Yeah. He's awesome. Yeah. What's your take on the explosion of streetwear? And also, do you feel like streetwear becoming high fashion is far removed from its hip hop origins? Mm. How do I not answer this as an embittered old man? <laughs> <laughs> um, the, the names, the boxes that we give these things are, are always interesting. Like high fashion, in giant air quotes, um, for years has been inspired by counterculture, right? Because there's there's like the you know the Chanel and the older woman that lives in like La Jolla or Paris. That's like you know I just want the the quilted jack, the traditional quilted jacket, and the shades with the big C's. And, and then there's a younger person that is chasing aspiration that needs a little bit more edge. Mm-hmm. And then you get a bunch of brands like designers like. D and G, like Dolce and Gabbana, were like early progenitors of like, mm-hmm. let's get edgy. Or Fiorucci was like this kind of mid tier level. Like Fiorucci was super punk rock. My mom hit me to Fiorucci. She'd buy me Fiorucci shit all the time before I was buying my own clothes. Um, <laughs> not now, <laughs> not now. Um, 
But there's always been a, a relationship, I think, not always, it, from the 70s on, you know, from um, really since Warhol, right? And I'm sure somebody else would have a different answer. This is my lens. I'm, I'm by no means a, a, an aficionado of the space. But um, the, the pop art phenomenon is what changed the paradigm. Right, and so then you get, if you take it to the hip hop space, you get cats wearing like, I remember in junior high, cats wearing like Yves Saint Laurent party socks, like party silks, like your uncle's see-through socks, mm -hmm. the, mm -hmm. you know, or, or British Knights and British Walkers and right. Clarks, that's all aspirational hip -hop shit. mixing high fashion with what was available right. to us and creating style out of right. it. Right, Kangle, yeah. again, right? Um, that is the, the beginning of of that phenomenon or that, that uh, cross pollination, if you will. Mm -hmm. I think a lot of the younger streetwear kids give themselves too much credit because this shit's not new, right? Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah, it's yeah. it's something that we've done. Like culturally, black folks, we 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 buy beyond our means. You know. Yeah, we invented we, that. Right, but we we invented that shit. So it's it's not a new thing. It's just hit different heights. And with right. the advent of social media, the it, the the um. The impact is, is just that much more magnified. Yeah. So, yeah, there's so sense? many younger kids that, I mean, well, number one, hip hop and skate cultures are now mainstream. And a lot of these newer kids, which I can say because I'm not 18 people, right. that's how they dress. Yeah, and, and they've they grown up in it, well, right? It's yeah. been around, it's been this whole like streetwear has been around since they were kids. It, right, right. It's a similar thought process. So, and you'll remember this, right? Like I remember getting a job literally so that I could have clothes to go to the club on the weekend. Mm -hmm. Like I would buy a pair of sneakers every week, which- My mom used to do that. As an old dude- as an old head, uh, <laughs> I'm like, that's fucking ridiculous. Right? I listened and to you sometimes on the Ask an Old Head podcast too. I was like, why nobody asked me to be on this podcast? Right. <laughs> I'm an old head. <laughs> yeah. um, peace to Justice Raji. Um, streetwear has turned into, and this is going to sound very curmudgeonly. So when we grew up, you, you, it wasn't a social ladder. It was a, a group of like-minded people, right? You mm -hmm. shared a, a uh, social equality. And that's why you ended up in these VIP spaces, mm. right? You'd go to the club, you'd walk up and they'd be like, who are you with? Da, 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 da. And you end up in the kitchen and somebody produces a bottle mm. or you end up in the actual VIP room. Streetwear started out like that. It was like, oh, he's got Vasks on. <laughs> we can have a conversation. Right. In the eighties, if you had vans in New York, they weren't, it wasn't popular. Yeah. You knew that this person was a skateboarder or a punker. Or, yeah, or a BMXer. And you would see them and you could have a conversation. They were approachable purely because of the fact they had vans on. Similarly, Got my vans like, on, but they, they look, look like sneakers. sneakers. That's when I started with <laughs> right. one van. Which is 2000, what, 11, 12, that's all? Right. Out? That's 2007 or eight. Four? I was in right. college. I heard it in well, okay, Bay Area, five. but we danced to that. <laughs> I heard it five years ago. My dance team. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, they got a song about vans. <laughs> but, These kids are crazy. <laughs> my dance team danced to that in college my sophomore year. So oh, that wow. was like 2008. Right. But it, this was Did like, they mention skating at all on that song? Maybe. It wasn't I don't know. For me. But it was it was like a subcultural badge of honor, right? Mm -hmm. Similar to like man, I would I don't know. Like well, it Theodore's reminds me, it maybe, reminds like, me of watching like Stretching by Beatles doc, Radio Changed Lives, and Bobby right. talking about when they printing up flyers for their show and right. getting on the train and seeing a kid and just by the way he was dressed, right. you like hip hop. You knew. Yeah. So I, to that same point, so fast forward, what's happened is that Nike started like the Nike LE thing and they would, pre-social media, they would seed product to people that they thought would be influential, proto-influencers, if you will. I don't, I don't know. There's a catchphrase. Content creators. But so Stupid phrase, what happens is content. you get now streetwear is like, so it used to be this ex exclusive thing that actually had a, a definitive culture. When I laugh when people are like, oh, it's for the culture. And I'm like, the culture is consumerism at this mm. point. There is no culture anymore. Mm. It's about who can consume the best. Wow. It's bottle service. And bottle service is clown culture. It's herb wow. culture. It's if herb you, culture. If wow. you're buying bottles, you're a fucking herb. Wow. Because mm. the real, the real yeah, VIP- 
<laughs> the real VIP knows the owner and you're in the office mm -hmm. drinking with the owner of the club. You're not like, oh, check me out. I'm spending four racks on a bottle. You're a clown. Right. Like, you... Speak on it. Right, a bottle that costs $40. And so sadly, that's the way I feel about contemporary streetwear mm. because it's become that. Mm. It's There's no hunt. Like... New Balance you used to have to go to Maryland and D.C. or Uptown maybe, mm -hmm. but it's mostly like Maryland, D.C. cats, like, you know, HBU cats, right? Mm -hmm. Or HBC cats, right? Mm -hmm. That were New Balance dudes. Mm -hmm. And you knew they were like kind of halfway down south. Right. Like, or they, they were from- HBCU cats? Or if you go to Space Killer. And I, I know what that is. Right. I, I, challenge. Said, I went to FAMU, but you said right. HBCU, then you said HBC. That was, that's all sorry, because I, I, I fucked up. But- <laughs> Oh, Okay. Um, Right. I corrected you just myself. The fuck up. I, he's like, yeah, they're eight, cool. they're historically like, I got you. <laughs> I fucked up. It's my bad. But um, I'm old, god damn it. Uh, <laughs> I don't need enough good. kinko biloba. Um, <laughs> so, but you knew that there was mostly dudes that went to like Howard or Grambling or whatever mm -hmm. that were like New Balance dudes. Mm -hmm. um, same thing with Uptowns. It was up. They were literally Uptown yeah. dudes. Anywhere that wore white on whites was from Harlem. That's the hustler shoe. That well, was a Harlem thing. Beef and Broccoli yeah. and Tim's were like some Brooklyn shit. I hate to see white shit. girls in the mall with they fucked up white on whites. Choked up and just- <laughs> It just pissed but, me off. But it's also, so culturally, like the social media things bugged out. I was speaking at this, or at, not speaking, pardon. I was privy to a hundreds conversation where somebody was like, some rapper dude, I forget his name. He was like, yeah, and Nelly put us on to white on whites and Uptowns. That was, and I was a like, whole debate last year. Are you out of your fucking mind? Right. Like Nelly discovered them 20 years later. Right. Like, and they was rhyming about all the colorways and everything. So they wasn't even doing it right. right. They're Shout not uptown anymore. Yeah. We love you, Nelly. We love you, Ali. I'm a fan. Me and Ali be arguing on Instagram. I, I don't. But um, <laughs> so there were these colloquial footwear. Mm -hmm. I don't. I don't know if that's a it's, thing. But, but I was like I was saying earlier when 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 Ghostface says they try to challenge God for the new bows. Right. It's like you had to be living that. Try to exactly. test the God for the new bows. So thank you. Part of me. Thank you. There is for correcting my Wu Tang doom, 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 doom. <laughs> lyrics. Sorry. There is still um, like exclusive streetwear now. I know my little brother is like really big into fashion, and he like goes to different places and like stands online for these like five shirts and but stuff see, that's like that. Not that it. They're gonna do. So here's the thing that that's not it. They that's say not it. that's so still the bottle service. My man, that's Bert, the bottle service. My All man right. Bert has the tattoos on his wrist. Never wait. Never pay. Mm. Mm. If you're doing either of those. Did you hear about this kid who got shot outside of Undefeated this summer? I can't, like. It's fucking crazy, right? Shot in broad daylight. So it's not even like the 90s That's Jordan crazy. thing or the 80s Jordan thing. It's like, we're just standing online and I'm pissed off because I can't get in front of you. So I'm yeah, the you. 80s, the Jordan thing in the 80s was real survivor mentality, sure. like real street shit. Yeah. You on La Brea in the middle of the day. <laughs> That's all, you know what I'm saying? I, I, it's fucking crazy. Man, that's, I, that was a tragic the, situation. The Kermit the Frog. Yeah. I don't know, but I, the never wait, and it's never tragic. pay. Pardon that's, me. I don't mean to downplay the. That's honestly my mantra. I'm literally going to write that up on a. Because I, I mean, that's how I try to live my life now. No, I mean, I'll go, I'll go to, I'll go to like a, a, a hot hype beast sneaker store. Because I'm a rapper, right? So I right. have to have a pair of sneakers for the show. And if I see a line, oh, it's not worth it. I'm yeah, like, not, I'm done. Because I go in, I'll be like, yo, I'm size 11. What you got in my size? Right. And I'm not even trying to be that pressed about it. I don't, I don't even follow it that much. I don't know the names of the sneakers. I'm just like, I know what, I, I know what looks good to me. Mm -hmm. What's in my size? And I pick what I like that's You're in my size. Right. Sometimes. <laughs> Sometimes they'll cut the these, line these for them. These, these stores, they'd be so hype beastie. They don't know who I am. Mm. <laughs> just, I'm not, I don't have enough hype. I don't ever stand in line. I cut lines all the time. And my favorite thing about being pregnant was that, I could just go straight to the front of wherever I was. That's dope. Let me ask you this, though, <laughs> because we're talking about Nikes. You convinced Nike to use the Dunks for the SB, right? So Drew Greer, mm -hmm. who always gets written out of the story, Drew and I connected in New York while I was still working for Mecca. And Drew was part of the LE conversation. Mm -hmm. Drew also went to China to find the original lasts for the Dunk. So Drew built the whole um, dunk revival program, if you will. Mm -hmm. So he did the Wu-Tang dunk. Alphanumeric was popping. And we were still, you know, in, in heavy contact. And 
he was like, yo, it was an ASR weekend. ASR is the action sports retail show. It's a show that happened in San Diego twice a year. There was a fall one and a spring one or spring, summer. And uh, he's like, my team and I are going to be there. They're trying to build a skateboard program. And I was wondering if we could pop into your office for a little while and, and, and have a conversation. So they had been building all these weird shoes that never really worked. And um, as kids, a lot of the pros skated in Jordans when the Jordans came yeah. out. And the, the even that, like the misnomers, like if you lived in a city, Jordans ended up getting put on sale really quick after the shootings. Mm. Yeah. Because retailers didn't want to be liable. And they're like, fuck, like this is crazy. If we mark them down, we don't need to keystone them, but we can still make a little bit of money. But And save a life. And save lives. Like yeah. we'll just sell them these these not so exorbitant prices. So then you had like the Tommy Guerreros and the Chris Millers and the Mickey Reyes of the world buy, and not us buying Jordans. Steve Caballero, the list goes on. So dudes started buying Jordans. The Dunk comes out, um, which is basically a Jordan as far as we're concerned. Mm -hmm. We would go buy them at Models because they also failed. Models. Got you looking hot. Right? Models. Right, exactly. <laughs> Are they still open? <laughs> I don't know. We had this whole conversation on the They're not still open, right? Episode. Oh, no, they are. There's one. Yeah. There's one Is in there? Garden City. Okay. <laughs> Dope. So we would just go get dunks and skating dunks. They had a flat bottom. They're built like a Jordan. They're leather, so they're going to last longer than Vans will. You don't have to put up a bunch of shoe goo on them. So we're having this conversation. I was like, well, Drew just brought back the dunk. Just use that. Ah. And then they were like, well, would you be interested in like doing a collaboration? And I actually wanted to do a Wildwood ACG and an Air Force One high with the strap because they had wow. stopped making the high with the strap. They had the, with the, the nylon strap okay. through the back. They had the one with the leather strap that came out the side. And okay. I was like, ah, some bullshit. The ACGs is the... That's so, the sneaker I wore back then with my Vask and my oh, ACGs. Yeah. I AC, wasn't on the Jordans. The ACG at that time. shit was popping. Yeah. That, that was kind of more of our MO. Because anyway. it was functional. Right. I wasn't, I didn't. I didn't buy a pair of Air Force Ones, so I moved to San Diego. Wow. I, I became was a rapper. I was in floss mode. <laughs> I, I was I like, still, I got I bread still now. Uptown. <laughs> <laughs> so everything was a little more crunchy when I lived in New York. Crunchy. Right. Yeah. And then, I, then, and then the floss came on when I moved to San Diego. <laughs> crunchy. Because it was like the bad boy era. Like, yeah. I was like, oh. <laughs> you, you was in the what club up? with the bottom. shiny, shiny, <laughs> shiniest, or whatever May says. So, so then, um, we do the alphanumeric. So it's the Wu Tang dunk. Then we do the alphanumeric dunk. I make two colorways that are for the team riders and immediate family only. Those there would never been a low top dunk. The original, the first time around, yeah. we do the low top dunk. It's there. Does they make it low top? I do the color ups. It's an alphanumeric dunk. Those first two colorways, they just took the alphanumeric logo off. Those are the first two low top dunks at market ever. Mm. Wow. But on phone. No cap. No cap. That's pretty good. Pretty did good. He just, you just did that, right? I said that. You did that. Okay. He, he just cool. dunked on us. He with the no cap talking about the, the no cap. I don't know. I, I hate I, that I'm, word. I'm, 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 I'm here. I'm here there, for right? I said it in facetiousness, <laughs> but it didn't work. That's why you shouldn't try and be facetious. I'm, facetious. I'm not very good at it. Uh, I'm not good at saying it, so we have something <laughs> in common. Uh, um, R.I.P. to Virgil. Did you guys were you guys able to interact much? And what do you think his legacy is going to be? That's a difficult one. So for years, people are like, "Y'all need to meet." Mm. Like you guys, you know, Virgil did all the shit that I wished that I had done. Mm. Mm. You know, the, the, the premise of, you know, when you get there, you don't do the barrel of monkeys, you pull your people up with you. Like, that's always been my MO. Like, that's what I'm built to do. That's what yeah. I'm put here for. And so I, I, I really enjoyed watching him do his thing. Mm -hmm. um, so my friend Nino was like, y'all need to meet. So he somehow like... DM'd us and then we ended up talking. We had a bunch of conversations about music and DJing, shared a bunch of music. And then um, I helped build the initial plan for the um, LV skate shoe stuff. Mm. Um, but then some shit got weird with money. 
with his handlers or his agent. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't work for clout. And it had nothing to do with him. I got you. Uh, it was more the, the powers, that, the other powers that be. So I had to walk away. Mm. It was difficult because I really wanted to work with him. Mm. But I, I, I'm i grown and Can't pay you clout, clout doesn't, yeah. Yeah. Um, but he's a, he was an incredible human being, like, and just did amazing things. And, you know, yeah. Yeah. Well, you say that you he did all the things that you wish you would have done. You still have... Oh, I, I'm. I got a lot of shit to get done still. Right, you got time. <laughs> yeah, you. Are, um, it's funny because going back to you saying I would start stuff and not finish it, and mm. then the five percent thing came in and helped me with that. True. But now, what the result of that is, you start so many things. Right. You end up finishing them. Right. Then you move on to the next project. Right. But you did fiber ops in Hong Kong yeah. and Tokyo, and right? Tokyo. But traveling in Asia, and that period in your life. How did that inspire you as a designer? Travel, music, culture, like interacting with different people um, on the day to day. I love like a lot of designers don't like going to factories or for vendors. Like mm -hmm. I would just go camp out because mm -hmm. I was like, I want to learn all the things and it's see all the things. From your mom dealing with those textiles yeah, back in the day. Absolutely. Yeah. And so I would just, you know, people, the design teams would normally like go to Hong Kong for like a week and I'd be like, I'm here for three months, mm. like, and just go be in the factories, be in the production agencies, walk the fabric vendors, because I wanted to see all the things. Because mm. normally somebody will bring you like a folder of fabric, like, oh, we thought you might be interested in this. And then when you see where the root of it, you're like, this is bananas. Like, I see the whiz for who he is now. Right. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, and I'm going to take over. Mm. Um, that sounds very aggressive, but like, and I would, I just camped out and then- uh, my friend Brian Siswojo introduced me to my brother Tabo, um, and then he and I started Fiber Ops together. So Tabo is Japanese, but he grew up part of his life in Hong Kong. Um, started the he was like one of the first hip hop DJs in Hong Kong, mm -hmm. um, and he and uh, Warren, sorry Warren, I can't remember your last name. He and Warren started a skate the first skateboard shop in Hong Kong called BFD, mm -hmm. um, and then later Brian was like you and Tabo need to connect and we started Fiber Ops. So we had an office in Tokyo, three stores in Japan mm -hmm. and an office in Hong Kong. But just experiencing different culture, like some of the best hip hop clubs I've ever been to and some of the best punk clubs I've ever been to are in Tokyo. Yeah, because I hear Tokyo is bomb for It's partying. off the chain. Harlem, like, and I would run into in people Tokyo. in Harlem all the time. Yeah, I'd run Harlem into Mike G and Red yeah. and like- Not the spot anymore like that. But nah, is Harlem the, the name of the club in Tokyo? Yeah, it's yeah. called Harlem. Okay, well, thank you and, for But like, <laughs> damn near every time I would run into like, excuse me, Mop Tops dudes, like Lee for Link. Oh, shout out like, to Mop Tops. Yeah. Shout out to Rubber Band. Yeah. And Peekaboo. And I, um, I went into Harlem um, in the Jiggy era. Years after I first went there, and I was like, "Oh, I'm an old head." <laughs> like, oh, they've moved on. Yeah, for real. <laughs> okay, I've heard you speak about, and this thing you were talking about in Asia reminds me of something I heard you say on a podcast. You were talking about the Russell Simmons era. Mm -hmm. You talking about how what he was doing was being an entrepreneur, but you're a designer, right? So, talk to us about the difference between the my state of being a designer versus an entrepreneur and how they might intersect and how they might conflict. Well, I'll start that with the the, the most well-known designers are also entrepreneurs. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, okay. So learning a degree of entrepreneurship was where, you know, that's, that's the thing. Mm -hmm. I think my problem is I'm too uh, task oriented when it comes to the problem solving of design. Mm -hmm versus the problem solving of the business, right? at least on my own end. Very good, like on a consultant basis, I'll mm -hmm. tell people where the bag is. Okay. Like super good at that. Okay. Just when it comes to myself, I'm always like, I know where the bag is, but I'm going to make this. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, Sounds like me and my music. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, I, you know, if you look at my social, like I kind of don't care. Mm -hmm. Like I'm really good at getting in my own way in that respect. Mm -hmm. Um. And I've got to figure that one out. I've actually talked to a hypnotherapist about- Hypnotherapist? So my man, Ryan Grant, uh, who used to play for 
um, Green Bay. Mm -hmm. Went to hypnotherapy when he left the NFL because his whole persona, or at least this is the way it was described, or, or pardon Ryan if I'm fucking this up, mm -hmm. um, because it, so much of his whole existence was being a football player and he had to be just be Ryan again. Um, mm. I, I quit smoking with hypnotherapy. And so similarly, like there's a lot of stuff where I get in my own way. It's a conversation we were having like with the like, oh, fuck you, you don't know. Like I know what's up, but you're like, you walk out the door and you're like, fuck. Mm. Like, <laughs> like I could have been a millionaire and I just flipped this dude off. Right. And it doesn't mean you need to suck up to people, but there's tact, um, there's uh, planning, like, Again, like I'm a great strategist when it comes to other people's projects. I need to be able to apply that to myself and get in my own way. So one of the things I'm working on or going to work on with this hypnotherapist is that. I am somebody who had an, like an adverse reaction to the idea of therapy. I mean, we grew up in Brooklyn. Sure. It's like, and, and I'm a musician. being a black male. Like, right. And I'm an artist. Right. So I'm like, my therapy's in my rhymes. Sure. But then my mother went to therapy. And you know, your mother's like your rock, right? Sure. It's like, wait, she, she had to go to therapy? Well, right. she's- she don't need no help or nothing. So when my, my mother went, I'm like, I need to rethink therapy. And I, I haven't gone, like, I went to marriage counseling when I was married. I don't sure. know if that's therapy. But um, we're interviewing Hobson tomorrow. Are you familiar with him as a Hobson, yeah. the rapper? The rapper. He's also a skateboarder. He's dope. He's so, dope. Pardon. I haven't heard any of his new shit. I haven't heard his stuff in like five years. Mm -hmm. But a friend of mine, like five, six years ago, hit me to him. And I was like, this dude's really well. He is. Really, but and you can tell he's like a really intelligent brother. He is. Like, and I knew, you know, some of his bigger records, but I didn't know his music. Right. And I'm doing the deep dive because I want to be prepared for the interview. Sure. And I'm listening to his early stuff. And I'm like, fuck, this is dark. It's so dark that some of it is disturbing. Right? Oh, it's real so, disturbing. Right. So I'm like, how am I, Talib Kweli conscious MC, right. going to broach some of these disturbing subjects that he raps about? Sure. And then I listened to him on um, No Jumper. Okay. And he talks about going to hypnotherapy. Wow. And he talks about how hypnotherapy changed his life. And the guy that I heard in that interview hmm. was not the guy that I heard on those records. Interesting. And me listening to him on No Jumper, shout out to Adam, was I thought to myself, this is like two, three weeks ago, I thought to myself, maybe I should try hypnotherapy. Because if it could make a dude like Hobson right. sound like this in his interview, there might be something to that. <laughs> so, <laughs> you know- I have two really good. So I DJ at this bar called the Tower Bar, and it's I want to like, come to that. I want to hear you. It's fun in like San Diego. A, yeah. So I do like different nights. Sometimes it's a punk night. Sometimes it's like an R and B, Northern Soul, Sixty Soul night. I want to do a guest set. Um, there. That'd be really. I'd love to have you down. Like just to do it for yeah, fun. Yeah, we would yeah. crush it. But Mick and Danielle, the owners, they both used to smoke, and I was I, my dumbass started smoking when I moved Cigarettes to San Diego. Weed. Cigarettes. Uh -huh. We'd. Mm, um, but cigarettes, I didn't start smoking cigarettes till I moved to San Diego. So I was already like 26, 27. Mm -hmm. Um, and then living in Asia, like people smoke in elevators and in meetings yeah. and like, you know, it's still like very, um, or was at the time complex. So it took, it was, I tried quitting a million times and then I asked them how they quit and they're like hypnotherapy. And I was like, like, yeah, I, like, yeah, man, yeah. I've heard some great things about Kinda this got, therapy. But at first I was like, get on with that. Like, right. that's some Fuck bullshit. And then um, I got so desperate because I spoke like a pack and a half a day. Like, it was of American spirits. Like, it was bad business. And I went and three sessions, the best 300 bucks I've ever spent in my life. I've three years not smoking a cigarette and not even craving. I've been hammered out of my brain, like, just drunk, blackout drunk. Not, I don't really get back blackout mm -hmm. drunk, but you know what I'm saying. I like, <laughs> Jared knows, but not. <laughs> <laughs> Was it regular have. drunk or Jared drunk? Jared, dr Jared drunk one. is a thing around. I love you, man. <laughs> <laughs> uh, um, but um, I've not even thought about a cigarette, so I advocate it. You know what I mean? Like it's, it's like a guided meditation. Awesome. Yeah, yeah. I need to. I, that settles and, it. I'm gonna look more into this. Um, so, how did you get into working in jujitsu? I mean, how did you get into working in, in the jujitsu? Blah blah blah. Jujitsu. Jujitsu. Jiu -jitsu. <laughs> um, I like said this word because I fuck up. I don't know. Whenever I say it, it's just it's not one of my best words. Emphasis. Both of those. Anyway, 
How did you get into working in the jujitsu? Jesus Christ! <laughs> jujitsu. 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 Now you sound like you're speaking Portuguese. Do I? For Brazilian jujitsu. People think I'm Brazilian. Uh, um, jujitsu. So, is that how you say, um, it? Is that how you say it in in, in jujitsu? No. no. How you say it? <laughs> um, you want to switch questions? <laughs> no, I got it. <laughs> Through my man Tone Anderson, um, we had. Well, I got to ask you the question. Oh. Okay. <laughs> How did I she get just got it? to the jujitsu part. <laughs> <laughs> I hope you don't have to go in three minutes because I fucked that You're up. Good. I'm good. Um, I got how all you, day. How did you get? In- <laughs> Y'all gonna be sick of me by the time ah. like, this motherfucker leave already? All right. How did you get into working in the jujitsu creative space? J- tell me about that at that time. <laughs> no, you did not. But what is continue. it? We're keeping that one. No, we're we're keeping Jiu-jitsu. that one. Jujitsu. There you go. Boom. Okay. How did you get into working in the jujitsu? <laughs> You know, if it's good to you, it's good. Just roll through it. Yeah. How did you get in? Oh, how did you get working in the jujitsu? How did you? Oh my god! What the fuck? I won't look at you. How did you get into working in the jujitsu space mm. as a creative deck? <laughs> <laughs> this is the word that ended Jasmine. <laughs> Y'all got right. dialed. I told you right before Nori said, y'all don't never make no mistakes. I can't wait till Nori sees it. Yeah, you, <laughs> you have to put, the like, this rolls. has to be a breakout though. Oh, yeah. okay. Um, okay. How did you get into working in the jujitsu space as creative director of Show Your Role? Yay! <laughs> um, I, I wasn't the creative director. I was a creative consultant, but, um, and a, a designer, kind of a, and a, a I guess there were three of us that were working in, on creative direction. Bear, who's the owner, and then uh, Cameron DeMarco. Through my friend, uh, Tone Anderson, who, um, Tone is a San Diegan. Um, he's originally from Guam, but he used to run a gym called uh, Undisputed and was a part of a brand called Folk Eye, which is also a fight brand. And we have a bunch of mutual friends and we ended up becoming friends. And then one day I ran into him actually at a brewery and he was like, hey man, like we haven't seen each other in a long time, but I've been thinking about you. Like, would you be interested in working in the jujitsu space? And I'd done actually through the gods. Actually prior to that, when I was a kid, I did some Aikido okay. at New York Aikikai in, in Chinatown. And then later practiced Kun Tao um, with the gods. So I was into martial arts, but I hadn't done anything in a really long time. And I was like, that'd be really interesting. Um, so we set up a meeting. I met uh, Bear Kittiga, who's the owner um, and founder of Show Your Roll. Um, and then Tone and I flew out to Tokyo with Bear um, and Lucas Lepri and um, sealed the deal. Mm. Um, Show Your Roll is kind of a special brand because they've somewhat revolutionized the space of geese in the in the jiu-jitsu space mm-hmm. um in doing collaborative projects with people kind of changed the way uniforms fit there's 16 sizes now um mm-hmm. because people you know in the garment industry that'd be a nightmare but in the jiu-jitsu industry it's actually groundbreaking um they just kind of like led the space i really got along with with bear um and we vibe off each other really well, as with Tone. And big shout out to Arby from AP. And it was just interesting to me because it was still the garment industry. I was kind of really tired of having to keep up with trend or pay mm. attention with, to trend. And here I could actually just innovate from a design standpoint, like mm. actual, the way a garment fits, the way it's cut, the way it's built versus like, oh, does it need to be pink this season or does it need to be tie-dye? So I was actually going back to problem solving versus like embellishing. Got it. Um, and I really dug that. And we just released a gi called the Articulated Gi, which I think is going to hopefully change a bunch of the industry. Dope. I love the way that skateboarding and martial arts intersects in your brain and oh, yeah. then out in the world. Absolutely. All the problem solving, that and, and bouldering. I really got into bouldering right before the quarantine and then I built a, a climbing wall in my office. I heard you talking so, about that. I thought that was very interesting because um, I was like, that goes right along with your sort of self-sufficient thing. Like sure. I don't need anybody else to do it. And you spoke, I think it was on the old head podcast with Justice's name, right? Yeah. You talked about 
the problem solving you learn from skateboarding yeah. and how it's similar to the bouldering and jujitsu and jujitsu. They're all right. very similar. The adrenal end of it, like, or is that a word? The, adre- the adrenaline. Sure. Adrenaline. Uh, I thought um, I can say that word. What the fuck? <laughs> adrenal sounded right, but um, yeah, that problem solving is really uh, fascinating to me and, and really intriguing. It's really fun. Right. Uh, the jujitsu and skateboarding is considerably faster. Bouldering, you have a little bit more time. And with jujitsu, obviously, there's another person mm-hmm. that's part of the equation. But it's all really fun. It's a very similar feel for me. Um, and I dig that a lot. Shout out to Ben Willis, who he's been on Instagram doing jujitsu lately. He's Dope. a guy, he was an AR at Ruckus. Back oh, in the day. all right. Yeah. Dope. I, I have to. Do I know Ben? I'll be excited about your jujitsu. He would, because he okay. talks about jujitsu on Instagram all day long. If he's not running, He's doing jujitsu. I gotta give. I feel two, like you guys are showing off. I gotta give out, two like... shouts: one to Tim Pablo, my first professor in jujitsu, and to Mike Phelps at Del Mar uh, Jujitsu Club. Mm-hmm. Oh, and also, um, oh God, I just forget. Why did I just brain fart so hard right now? This makes anyway, me feel it's cool. like I need to do jujitsu because the guys my age are doing it. You would dig it, man. So I need to do it's, this. And ha- do you need to learn how to do any more kicks? Oh, sorry. I don't know. <laughs> Shout, shout to Joel Tudor. Pardon. Well, I just, sorry, I have space on your name, I love Joel. the way you always check yourself to make sure that you're shouting people out too, because there's so much, they're so a part of your journey. Well, they, they're absolutely part of the journey. And, and, you know, not to sound corny, but like practicing gratitude. Like, yeah. there's so mm-hmm. many people that, like, you know, I always laugh at motherfuckers that are like self made, like, the fuck out of here mm-hmm. like every you, you just got to put in the work but nobody's self-made yeah, everybody's reached out to you know somehow if somebody stopped and giving you advice or giving you time you're not fucking self-made mm-hmm. that's right i tell people all the time when it comes to my music it's my name on the album cover but right. a whole team made this i just did a show at the they just opened up brooklyn bowl in philly shout out to those people i did a show and i have a band right and my band is like i'm letting the band go off everybody's doing their little you know solo right and there's this one white girl in the front and she's like the whole show she was like Kwali I love Talib and she was dancing so much at one point in the show I go I need everybody to act like her I'm I'm I said how she's acting right that's how I hear the music in my head but then when the band was doing the solos she's in the audience like I don't want to hear all that she's in the audience go do get by do get by this is during the drum solo <laughs> you can't give him any and I, I looked at her and I go Shh. And she's like, do get by. And I'm during the drum solo, I'm like, you can leave. Wow. Right? And she's like, Why? I'm just a fan. I just I did a whole speech. I'm like, she was, I'm like, yo, it's like going to see the movie Titanic mm. in a theater full of people, and you stand up and act one and go, Can we get to the boat sinking already? <laughs> <laughs> Let the story develop that I'm fucking trying to tell you. Word. How fucking dare you come here? You disrespect these musicians. Mm. Mm-hmm. On my stage, who if it wasn't for musicians like these, these are not the guys who played Get By. Right. Kanye made that beat. But if it wasn't for Kanye sampling Nina Simone sure. and the musicians who played that music, there would be no Get By. So have respect for the craft. Hmm. Shout out to my fans who um, need to check their privilege. <laughs> I'm glad she paid for a ticket. <laughs> I hope she stayed to hear my rant. Do Get By. <laughs> um, Salema and you have something else in common. You both have stoked mentoring as a part of your story. I'm adjacent to Stoked okay. via Salema. Okay. You okay. know, um, I, a mutual friend, Derek Alkin, um, has a company called Autotype, and he's been like, you know, I'm, I do graphics, but I'm more of an actual, like, I designed this jacket. Like, I designed That's nice. I was actually, looking at the jacket you. when you came in, too. Thank you. I actually designed- What size is that? It's <laughs> my, my size. I look like my cousin's size. <laughs> oh, um, so- it's like when dudes used to put their foot next yep, to you. Yeah, right next to you. Besides, I look like my size. My size. Um, so <laughs> I feel like I brought you all the way back to Brooklyn. Yeah, I'm, all, I'm on the B train right now at Atlantic <laughs> Avenue. <laughs> Derek's been like, hey, let's do a graphic thing. Um, and I hadn't done, you know, I, I mess around in graphics, but I, I'm not, that's not like my strong set, depending, right? If it's like some punk rock, like zine style thing, I feel like that's where I excel. Um, but so he was like, well, let's 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 do something. And I was like, well, can we do something with Stoked, mm-hmm. which is Salema and Steve's thing. Having grown up skateboarding in New York, the fact that they're mentoring through the space of skateboarding, surfing, and snowboarding um, with kids in the city, 
just resonated with me and I, I yeah. you know I wanted to show some sort of support so we built the the peace shirt and it's a you know a five percent or acronym absolutely so please educate all children equally That's um right. and so it's the you know a peace shirt simultaneously and I have to say this because I love this man and he's always been super supportive and so Frank the butcher started oh, the, the peace program right when this actually before my t-shirt dropped shout to Frank a big shout to Frank I, I Frank's helped me put food on my table and I owe him a big debt of gratitude he's a great human being so we dropped that and then that's kind of my connection to stoked mentoring um, and I'd yeah. love to do more stuff with them and we just kind of Derek asked me to to uh, find some other artists to to kind of carry on the mm-hmm. acronym so knowledge Bennett is actually going to do a shirt and I'm excited for that. And Tito Dallaire. Do you know Harlem Slim? No, I don't. We went to high school together. And you went to LaGuardia, right? Yeah. There's so many kids from LaGuardia on this show. Shout out to LaGuardia. Yeah, big Faith. shout out to LaGuardia. I'm, I'm going to live, live forever. forever. <laughs> Actually, it, it, I think that's the school that I had wanted to go to. Because you yeah, had the told audition. That story. Yeah, you, you had told the audition. Story yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Um, yep. I like um, that acronym. An acronym I got from the gods back in the days was Positive Education Always Correct Errors. Errors. The gods are good with the acronyms. Oh, there's a lot of really good ones. Or the backronyms. That's what I was just about to ask, was it a backronym technically? A backronym already... is when you have the word first and then you create the meaning. Okay. Right. Because you knew you wanted to say peace, but you had to come up with... I've learned something new today. Thank um, you. That's dope. Before I ask you this final question, I want to ask you about, because we don't get enough chance in this current like fast food culture hmm. to really pay tribute to the greats. Um, tell me about the influence of uh, Romare Bearden on you. So again, like my mom, you know, we moved to New York. She was you know, immediately immersed in the art world. Mm-hmm. Um, somehow, and I, I need to ask her this, but I don't know how her her relationship with he, he and his wife, and I don't even remember her name. It's horrible. Um, but we would go to their house pretty wow. often. That's crazy. On Canal Street. They lived on Canal at- So you had direct uh, contact. Yeah, and we would make, my favorite thing, and go, like I'm like eight, nine, mm-hmm. so this is 1978, 1979, 1980. My favorite thing was we would make paper airplanes and we have paper airplane battles. You want to oh. have a paper airplane battle? <laughs> Somebody bring us a paper. Um, I'm ill at this shit. But, but, Are you? <laughs> but I'm his. Nice. I made paper airplanes for my nephews at Thanksgiving. They were amazed. He, oh. he and Jacob Lawrence's style were, were really. Yeah. Um, I gravitated toward them and, and also Nelson Stevens. My dad was friends with Nelson Stevens. That's all wow. other, like my dad was friends with like Nelson Stevens, Max Roach, and Archie Shep. At, that whole and connection, I, um, Fab Far Freddy was around, right? I don't know. That's a good question. He so my, does a, we, um, a documentary on Netflix about cannabis, and okay. he talks about his father being friends with Max Roach and them hanging wow. out at Max Roach's uh, crib in, in Bed-Stuy back then. Okay. The you know, so, and uh, when is, I was coming up, uh, A.L. Roach was... Hanging out and Raul Roach is somebody who I've done activist work with. That's dope. They were all. This is all when they were still in Amherst, um, doing the Afro Cobra thing in Africa House, um, and then also Marion Brown. Shout out, who, yeah, Marion Brown. Shout out to Gingy um, Brown. So my dad was also friends with Marion Brown. Yeah, man. And then Gingy Marianne. and I met later um, through graffiti, ironically, and punk rock. Gingy's ill. Gingy's super ill. Super slept on. He'd be a great person. <laughs> I didn't go anywhere. Um, some of my favorite memories of like a young childhood were throwing paper airplanes out of the window um, of Romare Bearden's loft across Canal Street. And whoever I didn't even could know get, I was the, get that. Like, I thought I was just going to hear like some abstract no, inspiration story. No, and obviously his art, like, but it was direct. And we would draw a lot and just draw scenes. I wanted to plug this thing that I'm trying to do. Well, the next question is, what's next for okay. Ali Asha Moore? Right now, I, I still work with Shoddy Roll, um, and I'm the director of apparel and accessories at a toy company called Super 7 Toy that's that Oh, wow. Toys oh, awesome. We both have kids. That makes action. I don't have kids yet. No, we both have kids. Oh, yes. Brand right. new babies. I got you guys. Don't even trip. We just made a Biggie Smalls action figure. Much. That was amazing. <laughs> we just made I'm a B.I.G. figure. For this company? Yeah. Wow. Um, officially licensed. There's a biz one coming out, and there's an ODB figure, oh. uh, Johnny Cash, a bunch of like cool, interesting um, movie and music IPs. And then what I ultimately want to do is do what would be Alphanumeric 2.0, but sans the street we're in, but more of, uh, I don't like the term 
probably because I'm a five percenter, we refer to people as original peoples. Yeah. But um, a POC Patagonia, if you will, oh. um, called Guidance System, and I've just been an working, outdoor space. Yeah, but an outdoor brand. Mm -hmm. um, that's a little bit more. Um, this is what you're trying to do with the new. <clears throat> Just my own shit. I've alpha, been, alpha numeric yeah, thing. And it's called guidance system. Mm -hmm. But kind of pick up where we left off. I feel like in the outdoor space, there's no attitude. It's like a bunch of people make the same kind of stuff. The photography is always the same. It's always like a white dude with a beard standing over like a a, uh, a waterfall. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Like you're just like, all right, that's sick. Like right. same picture, different brand. Um, here's, an, here's something that's interesting. You brought up, you made me remember that I was wearing Vasque and A solos mm -hmm. as like, that's so interesting to me because that outdoor wear we were wearing and, you know, Columbia and all that stuff we were wearing back then was so practical for New York City kids, mm -hmm. but so fashionable at the same time. Sure. It's That's funny now because I see, like, they make fun of that now on the internet, that style. Like, yeah. they make fun of those hats and people who wear goggles when you didn't right. need to wear goggles. My right. grandmother always bought those hats with the ears. I hated them. I was talking, I'm so. talking about the conscious rapper winter hat. Like, winter hat. Like this, yeah. but with the bill? The Jeep cap. Yeah, and it had the ears, right? <laughs> yeah, that's, ears. That was, the, fl the things that go over your no, ears, no, no. they didn't have He's those He's talking about it. It's a beanie with a brim. It's called the Jeep oh, okay. cap. Is that but I know called? what you're talking okay. about. Yeah. It's a Jeep cap. You're talking about the thing that... Uh, with the it ears? has a the, cap, the, and it also has ears. If there's ones that fold down from the outside and the ones that fold from the inside. But like my passion, the thing that, you know, going back to the problem-solving space, what I really, really am passionate about is building outerwear, technical outerwear. Mm -hmm. Um it's actually something that I feel like I'm probably better at than any of the other spaces that, I, you know, besides well, connecting people. Well, your outfit people. right now is very fashionable, Thank but you. very much like you can go work on a farm as well. I, oh. That's another goal. Like, yes. just go buy some That land. wasn't a diss, by the way. Like <laughs> no, a and, and thank, compliment. Sorry, pardon me. Thank you. Um, I really appreciate that. <laughs> I don't think those boots uh, need to be on a farm. Those... Those boots are, are going to get messed up on a farm. But they look like they're, they're they look like a working man. He could like go and probably manage a farm, like a farm. He's seen some shit. I, I'm, I'm, Literally. I really like working with my hands. Oh, do you? Um, and I intend on building my own house at some point in time. I'm good at working with my hands. That's awesome. Not to be on some cocky shit. But. They didn't see him do this, but he built this table before he got it. <laughs> <laughs> no, he did. I remember. I was like, why is our guest working? Like, what's going what? on? Aliash was under the table hooking up the mic. With his hands. Mm -hmm. I, yeah, and I like boots. I like building things. I like problem solving. I like fixing things. Sometimes to a detriment. Mm. <laughs> well, we are glad to have you. We have jobs here for you if you ever want to come. <laughs> I, would, I would love to come work with staff. you and your wonderful and, staff. Fix our tables and, and, and our mics. All day. I'm and, down. Um, Let me know. The great Ali Asha. Thank you. Thank you, Talis. I appreciate that. Peace. Appreciate Thank you. Peace. Peace to the gods. Peace. Peace.